Welcome everybody to the final session of our Special Education Leadership Summit. We've appreciated your presence and we are going to practice presence for the next hour with Lisa Lucas. Just a couple of things to keep in mind. We are here for an hour. It is being recorded. At the end of this session, I will be providing the session code that you will submit into the credit verification survey that will open up at 3.30 this afternoon. That survey will need to be completed by the close of business on Friday, August 6th, but you can certainly do that sooner than that. Won't take that long. Um, any handouts that you've needed throughout the, the two days of our summit are still on the website that you can access. If you have any questions for Lisa as we go through, I highly encourage you to put them in the chat. What is very helpful is if you type in all capital letters, the word question, Q-U-E-S-T-I-O-N, and then follow that with the actual question that you have for Lisa. That helps us to monitor the chat and pick up the questions that you have that we wanna make sure that we address for you as we go. We will also be using breakout rooms at some point during this session just so that you're aware of that. And our tech person, Awesome Rob, will be helping with that. And I'm going to turn it over now to Lisa so she can introduce herself and get things going so we can be present in the moment with her. Oh, thank you, Sandy. It is really an honor to be here. And I realize this is the last session of your day on this beautiful, sunny, warm summer day. So I wanna thank you for all of you that are in attendance right now. This will be an experiential session, and I'm excited at the beginning. It's always an invitation. And so when I do some practices, I'll invite you, always optional. Um, my background is as a teacher, an instructional coach, an administrator, and now my full-time position is a job at Westchester University as a professor there in the College of Education. And when I first went to the university, my research was coaching and I quickly shifted to stress reduction for educators. You see, I thought it was just me. I thought I was the only one that was overwhelmed and stressed. And I quickly realized when I started placing students in the field that we have an epidemic of stress in our educational system. And so what I wanted to do was find the best research about how to help navigate not alleviate, but navigate the turbulent times we experience as educators. So without further ado, I'm gonna take this away and let us know where we're going. And so I will give us an opportunity to connect early on. I'll do one breakout room and I'm gonna utilize the chat in a second, but most of the presentation will be something that you can simply view. And um, many of you have your cameras off. And when I do a practice, I'll actually encourage you to put your camera off. You'll see what I mean by a practice in just a second. Um, we all know what stress is, but I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview in the research so that we can really understand better what it does to our bodies and our minds and our future, not just the present. And the big takeaway from this presentation are practices. I'm going to give you at least 10 practices in less than an hour that you can integrate into your daily life. So before we start, I wanted to just utilize the chat and it's the time of year this year that we have amusement parks open again. And I thought that was a really good way to kind of get a touchstone of how you're feeling right now. And so I list some um, typical rides at an amusement park. Can I just ask you in the chat, and I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see the chat. Can you just list how you might feel right now if you were at an amusement park? Do you feel like it's a roller coaster? Are you in the haunted mansion? Maybe the merry-go-round, bumper cars? Let me just see some responses. How do you feel right now? Getting some roller coasters. Yep, log flume. My favorite response is someone wrote once that, yeah, I like the fun house, that they felt like they were in the hell hole. That was an old fashioned ride where you'd go round and round and round and then the bottom would drop off. Okay. And, and so we all are feeling, um, I would guess, a little bit of the effects of what it means to be an educator in 2021 right now. 
And so this is this is my favorite illustration of what I feel like often <laughs> is I'm just trying to keep that rock from not falling in my head. And as I go into schools, I'm in schools quite a bit. This is what I see. I see I see people that look like this. I see administrators that look like this. I see paras, I see teachers. And so why? And so I'm gonna ask us again to take a second and utilize that chat. And there's a handout that corresponds with this, but there were some handouts. If you don't have the handouts for the session, you don't need them. If you just have a piece of paper and a pencil, you can actually just jot some things down. And so can I ask everybody, what's the stress in our teaching life right now? Um, let's see in one minute how many I can get to respond in the chat of some of your current stressors. I'm gonna stop sharing again. So just start listing some stressors. Let's see what you have. Time, students, COVID, So many unknowns. Yes, yeah, staffing issue. Started school year. And so a lot of the research, we could do this all day long, okay? There, there's just so much. And so when I do a face-to-face -face workshop, it's about now that I put up um, stickies, you know, big poster board stickies and let participants put all their stressors and then I leave the room and I take a break and I get a cup of coffee and I come back and everyone's still writing. And so we could do that all day. And, and that's just simply admiring the problem. And I would love to tell you that I'm here to wave a magic wand and make all of those stressors go away. Nothing would make me happier. The reality is we would just replace them with different types of stress. So what I can do though, is give you some very simple techniques that are research-based that we can help navigate, as I said, some of those overwhelming stressors. Many of you put uncertainty, and I just wanted to say, that's one of the main causes of stress is the unknown, not knowing what's to expect. And, and so education has been stressful for quite a while. This isn't new. However, I really want everyone to recognize with all the uncertainty we're facing, we, have, we not only have an epidemic and a pandemic out there of COVID and disease, we have an epidemic of fear and stress of the unknown. So any uncertainty you're feeling, you're not alone. So the work that I'm gonna share is based on, and at the very end of the session, Sandy's gonna give a few of the books away. It's based on my book that's called Practicing Presence. And it's really meant to provide sustainable, practical, applicable tools that you can integrate into your daily educational lives to help with stress. And just to give you, because this presentation is gonna follow this acronym outline, I took the word presence that you see outlined here in blue, and each chapter of the book expands on some practices that you can do correlated with that letter. So I've taken the word presence as an acronym, and now I'm gonna take a little bit of time to highlight some of the practices in the book. So first thing that I always wanna do is to really clarify what presence is. I very intentionally, when I did the research, did not wanna focus just on mindfulness, just on self-care. What I wanted was I wanted a research-based, multifaceted approach to how we could help. And so it does have elements of self-care, has a lot of practices related to self-compassion. If you're not familiar with the work by Kristen Neff, she has a great deal of information about self-compassion. Self-compassion sounds soft, just like self-care does. And I'm here to tell you they're not soft skills because if we can't be kind to ourselves and we can't care for ourselves, we're gonna really at some point lose our ability to be present and care for others has a lot of um, roots in presence in mindfulness. It's being present. And when I think about present, the way I like to really illustrate this is 
we all know when someone isn't present. You, you can be right there in their midst. You can be looking right at them and you feel they're not with you. And so presence needs to be something that we cultivate for ourselves so that we can then be present for our students. And of course, the social emotional learning is huge because that's a huge component. But most of the time we talk about SEL related to students, which is oh so important. But I also think that we need to be aware of our own social emotional needs. Resilience, if we, if we aren't able to build on our resilience skills, that will at some point, may not, not be right now, but at some point be a problem. So being aware of how do you cope and everything is really based in neuroscience. So that's my kind of big shotgun approach to trying to define presence. You know this old adage to put your oxygen mask on first and, and there's good reason for this. Um, the research shows over and over that if we aren't taking care of ourselves, that we won't have the capacity to care for others. And so I used to, when I first started doing this research, I was going into schools and I was working with children and I was doing demonstration lessons on things like mindfulness and presence and self-regulation and, and various things. And what I realized is I really needed to focus on the adults because as the adults, the students are looking to us, and that is oh so important. And they're not just looking to us about how we teach and how we are when we're actually game on teaching or working with them. They're really watching us when we're in the hallways, when they notice something goes wrong, when they see that we have to handle a crisis. That's when our students really hone in and pay attention. The R in presence has a whole chapter on how we can learn to respond rather than to react to the daily stressors. Because over and over, what we know is that throughout our very busy days, we're going to have things that call our attention, that take us away from our best laid plans. And if we have the tools so that we can very thoughtfully respond Instead of overreacting, what we're doing is we're modeling for our students how we handle those unprecedented situations. And, and one of the things that I think our students need to see is how we treat ourselves when things go wrong and when we make a mistake. The quote at the bottom talks about if, if you treated your friends like you treated yourself, you might not have any friends. Many of us are really hard on ourselves. Can, can I just... Um, have um, any hands up or anything? Anybody feel like you're hard on yourself? Anybody, anybody feel that way in any way? Can't really see, so we don't, yeah. Yes, we're, we're tough. We can be really, really tough on ourselves. And so learning that we need to go easy. Okay. And so this is gonna be our first and our solo breakout session. And this is going to be uh, an example of how we can go easy on ourselves. And this is something that maybe you'll replicate with staff or with students or in meetings in the future. And I had no idea where I got this. I think I, the origins might have been from responsive classroom, but it's called Life is Good. And really, when I would, and I still do this when I teach at the university, I always begin in a circle. And what we do is we just want to level the playing field so that we realize we're all facing tough times. And so everyone shares, and this is what I'm going to ask you to do in the breakout room. Everyone shares one thing that isn't so good right now. Now I'm going to ask you, since I don't know any of you and we haven't built that rapport, let's not take a deep dive into things that are really, really traumatic. Little things. Um, and the example I have for little things is my favorite one that I ever heard is a student that said, this morning I sat in my turtle. And then after you share what your little thing that isn't so good, then with as much false enthusiasm, you just say, but life is good. Okay. And so in a breakout room, I want you to think of anything since Monday morning till this moment that hasn't been so good. 
share what it is, and then afterwards say, but life is good. And so they're going to put you in breakout rooms with about five participants. So we really just will need about, I would say, three minutes tops for this activity. And it's going to be our one breakout room. So let's go ahead and do that now. So although that seems kind of like a mundane, silly practice, you know, there is so much research saying that what we are missing right now is connections. We're missing connecting, we're missing sharing, we're missing having that human experience of really empathizing and being able to hear and share with others. And, and so as often as you can, I would encourage all of us to think of ways that we can connect. Now in, in this presentation, it doesn't have a lot more of that opportunity. However, you know when you can create those opportunities in your lives. Okay, so I enjoyed the breakout room I was in. It was, we had common injuries. It's always nice to, to hear that somebody else is going through something. In the, in the next probably 45 minutes, I'm gonna share a variety of practices. And I stole this phrase from a colleague, Laura Weaver, and she, I heard her say, you can rent a practice. You don't have to buy it, just try it on. And, and so I'm really going to encourage you to write down, because there is, again, as educators, you know this, we remember and we retain and we recall information when we work with it. So rather than any other way to remember this, just stop and jot a practice if it's one you want to remember. And at the end, you should have about 10 different practices to choose from. No one's going to use all of them, but you can try on some and figure out what works for you. The first is unpacking your bags. And, and so we as educators are famous for our to-do list. We have them on our computers, we have them on our phone, we have, many of us have multiple ways that we write down what we have to do. And so one of the best practices I've adopted is, is when I look at my to-do to -do list, I look at it carefully and I find what I can take off. <laughs> and I know you're gonna say, there's nothing I can take off. I'm gonna challenge you to look at your to-do list and think about what could you do. And when you're teaching or when you're doing meetings with your colleagues, I call this unpack your bags. And so when I start any presentation or any class, I'll ask students, get out of your head what's on your mind. Unpack your bags, write it down so that you can let it go. So often we're ruminating and ruminating and ruminating about what we didn't do or predicting what we have to do. And so right now, if you have anything you need to jot down, jot it down and then let it go. And then when you do revisit that to-do list, I want you to really consider, is there anything you can delegate or take off? That's a huge one. Sounds simple, but we often don't think of delegating or taking off. And this is in line with, with a practice that I have. It's called Fuels and Drains. Um, it's in the book. And the idea is that you take stock of everything in your life that's draining you. And so you look at all aspects of your life. You look at work, you look at home, you look at leisure, you took, look at finance, you look at organization, and you list your drains. And the idea is that before you can add any fuels to your life, just like curriculum, before we should add new curriculum, we need to eliminate some old curriculum. And so first thinking about what is draining you, you know, it could be as simple as um, someone that you talk to every day that you realize all you do is complain or you know your drains, but just really taking into consideration what you can eliminate. Again, we pare down before we add. And then of course, the next step and where we'll move on is what fuels can you now add to your day to replace some of those drains? The best way I can explain some of these practices that as I said at the very begin beginning are just really practical is by this legend. It's an old legend in, um, that comes from the Cherokees. And it's about a young boy that's sitting with his grandfather. And the young boy says to his grandfather, grandfather, what wisdom do you have for me today? And the grandfather said, well, grandson, I want you to know that in your mind, 
you have two wolves. You have one wolf that is negative, that is angry, that is judgmental, that is vindictive, that's pointing out what's wrong, that isn't collaborative, that's competitive. And you have another wolf that's positive. And that wolf wants to connect and to support and to empathize and to go easy and to show compassion and to care and to show gratitude. And the young boy said, well, what are those two wolves done doing? And then the grandfather said, there's a fight going on between those wolves every moment. And the young grandson says, well, which wolf wins? And the grandfather said, it's the one you feed. And so what you need to do is to think about how you can feed your brain. How can you feed your brain full of things that are going to support that good wolf? Which takes me to, this is my most favorite practice. It's not strictly a mindfulness practice. It comes from the Institute of Heart Math. And it's one that I use all the time before I do a presentation, before I teach, or even if I just have a few mo moments and I wanna bring some coherence into my brain and body. And so, as I said, it comes from the Institute of Heart Math. And the research shows that it has, the it has something to do with neurocardiac coupling, which actually means that you can bring coherence between your heart rhythms and your brain very quickly. And I'm going to invite you, and it's an invitation. Most of you have your cameras off. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take your camera off. And this practice could be as long as 20 minutes, or it could be as short as two minutes. I'm going to make it just two minutes. And I'm really going to encourage you to try it on. I'm going to keep it short. And I want you to see if you notice any difference between how you feel now and how you might feel in just a second. So I'm going to stop my video as well. And the first thing I'm going to ask everybody to do is go ahead and turn your cameras off if you're comfortable. And I want you to stand up. I want you to actually stand up. Many of you have probably been sitting for a long time and reach your arms way up high to the sky and then exhale and bring them back down. Again, you're just stretching way up high and then exhaling. The reason I like to do that is because before you ask your body to sit still for a moment, you need to give it a chance to expel some of that extra energy. And so now as you gently sit down, I'm gonna invite you to place your feet flat on the floor and sit upright. I like to say tall like a tree so that you're relaxed, not rigid, but your spine is aligned. And gently take your hands and for now, place them palms down on your lap. And at the same time, make sure your feet are flat in the floor. And if it's available to you, gently close your eyes. Now just notice your breath. You don't have to do anything special, just notice it. And now place your hand, if you're comfortable, on your heart. And notice if you feel the rise and fall of your chest. Perhaps you detect your heart beating. And now bring to mind a person or a place or a pet that brings you joy. Whatever you just thought of, that's it. And see if you can really visualize this person or this place or this pet. It's just something that gives you that good feeling. And now breathe as if your heart is doing the breathing as you visualize this person, place, pet. And in a moment, I'm going to ring a chime. And tune in to the chime. And when you can no longer hear the vibration of the chime, I'll ask you to open your eyes and bring yourself back into the space of this presentation. OK, 
Okay. And now can I ask that in the chat, can you perhaps share how that made you feel? Take a moment. Seeing some centered, peaceful, refreshed. Yeah, and that's in less than a minute. And that's what all the practices I do are intended to do. You, you don't think it'll do anything in that short amount of time, but it can. And I just always want to add an addendum. Sometimes when we do that, sometimes we get that little bit agitated because we're so used to going so fast and to doing so much. And so when we slow down, that's when perhaps we can get a little bit of an anxious feeling. So most of you did not say that, but if that did happen to you, I want you to realize that that's okay too. So again, that's the um, heart coherence technique that comes from the Institute of Heart Math. That's one of the handouts that I wrote up that you have. Okay. Now, we're in schools and we know that not all teachers, leaders, and parents are really in the present moment. Many of us are running around putting out fires as fast as we can. And the present moment is elusive. However, my belief is that the more we can do to make our schools places where we are present and optimistic, the better our students are going to feel, which will then transfer to their learning. We all know from our social emotional learning research that when you feel calm and many of the adjectives that you just put in that chat, when your state is centered, that your brain is on board and you're better able to take in information, retain information, and then later apply information. And so what we wanna do as much as we can to model this present moment. However, you know, oftentimes, and, and trust me, I'm not throwing stones because I've been there myself. When I walk around the hallways of schools, what I hear when teachers get together and administrators, educators everywhere, the first thing that we do is what we did when we did that first activity, the life is good. We do a little bit of complaining, okay? Now, I'm not here to tell you to never complain. I wrote an article on, on this. Um, and that's a different presentation, but I've done some research about adopting something, what I call the no complaining rule, and I'm just gonna give you the takeaways. Here's what I know. If the primary way students are gonna learn social emotional skills is watching us, then we need to show them some tools to use after we complain or when we complain if you complain. And so here's three ways you can turn a complaint around. The first is, so I'm just gonna make it a complaint. Some of you might think, oh my goodness, it's summer, it's July, it's Tuesday, it's a blue sky, beautiful day, and I have to, I have to attend a workshop. All you have to do if you make that complaint is at the end of it, add the word but. But I know I'm gonna leave having made some connections and with some more information. Another semantics, instead of saying, I have to attend that workshop, simply changing it, I get to. It changes the way it feels. And these are really simple things, but if you adopt them and you start noticing, I'm gonna challenge you to notice in your midst everybody that complains as from now until the end of the day and see if you can see if where they could change it to get to instead of have to. So the no complaining tools is another tool for your toolkit. The truth is that if we had the time and we could sit and we could actually talk, you would find out that you're not alone. My experience shows that whenever I'm in a room, the person to my left and the person to my right usually has something even more difficult going on than I do. And so we can't change all those factors, but what we can change is our response. Actually, that's the only power we have is in changing our response to what comes our way. I think it helps to know that you're not alone when you feel like you're struggling. 
And so how do you respond to stress? So if we had more time, we would actually share out, but you know, there are healthy ways and not so healthy ways, and they all affect the brain. The effect on what happens, not to the stress, not to what happens, but how we respond, that's gonna have implications for how our brain is actually growing, how it's paring down, how it's creating new neural pathways. And so, you know, if you go home every night and you're so stressed out and you have a glass of wine, once in a while that's okay, but think about what else could you do to respond to stress? And we're gonna take a deeper dive into that in, in just a little bit. And so this is where I wanna just talk a little bit about stress. I think most of us know this research, but it never hurts to do a quick repeat. And so our stress is really our body's way of doing exactly what it was designed to do. We have in our brain two amygdala that are constantly scanning for what could go wrong. And when our amygdala detects something that's wrong, what it does is it takes our prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of our brain off board. And that's the area where we are thoughtful, where we are caring, where we pause. And so our amygdala is doing its job because back in the day when we were cave dwellers, there might be a tiger in our midst. And so our amygdala needed to take our prefrontal cortex off. It needed to flood our bodies with all kinds of hormones like epinephrine and cortisol and all of those stress hormones to give us the energy to run, to get away from whatever that predator was. The problem is, is that now that stress response is happening, not because a tiger's after us, but more so just because our email freezes or because we have a parent request or because we have a student that has a really volatile situation or you could name all of the stressors you already named. But what's happening is every time we have that response, our bodies are flooded with these hormones. And so that's like the not so good news. But here's the good news. There is so much research. I always point to Richie Davidson, who's doing a lot in education that shows by learning some simple self-compassion, mindfulness, self-care skills, you can actually learn that when you get that first stress response for you to be able to control your amygdala response and keep your prefrontal cortex on board. Now that's amazing. And, and that really is showing that we can control our brain. But you have to practice these things when you're not stressed out, because if they don't become automatic, just like automaticity and reading, if they don't become automatic and they don't become a part of your problem solving repertoire, you're not gonna use them when you really need them. Simple things, like this is so simple, but it makes a difference. Like when you say, I should have done this, well, quickly hearing that and stopping. Stop shooting on yourself. Stopping, stop doing everything yourself. Give it to somebody else. We all think we're the only ones that can handle things. Start delegating and give yourself more space. Stop putting more to do and not enough time. And even looking at some of your social obligations. You know, sometimes you have a full calendar when really what you need is space in your calendar. Those are just simple attitudes that increase stress that you could be in control of. Um, I, I'm making it a practice to do this in every presentation. And so not only are our bodies stressed, our eyes are stressed, they're fatigued. And so the ophthalmologists are talking that every 20 minutes, you should be looking in the distance 20 feet away. So I'm gonna encourage you right now to take a second, if you wear glasses, take them off and just turn. And if you can view a window, that's ideal. But if not, just turn and look 20 feet away, anything other than looking at that monitor. And as you do it, just simply take an inhalation and an exhalation. Your eyes, rather than closing, the distance actually gives them that break they need. One more inhale and exhale and come back. 
So simple, so simple, but so needed. So even setting an alarm on your computer when you're working to ding every 20 minutes and just doing that. I only just did that practice for a minute. I know this myself and it's something I'm still trying to learn. We go faster and faster so often and what we really need to do is slow down. One of the most difficult things for me is to slow down. Notice how busy and even when you don't have something to do, how you fill that time. Because the more time we can be present, the more time we can bring forth our resilience and our more flexible self. All of the research talks about it's in times of contemplative quiet that we do our best thinking. And if we're not building that into our day, we're missing out on that opportunity for presence. Just want to take a pause here and just share without taking a deep dive into the research that all of the things that I'm talking about about in terms of these simple practices have the research behind it to say they're helping with all of these things and they can help. They can't alleviate, but they can diminish anxiety and depression and stress. And so they're practices that are good for you and they're also good for your students. When we want to use these practices is most often in the morning. And what I also often say is put your big rocks in first. That comes from Stephen Covey. He talks about if you don't prioritize and figure out what matters most to you and fill your days and begin your days with that, then your days are going to be filled with the small pebbles of other people's priorities. Things like emails and um, to-do lists. Every email to me is usually just a task that somebody else needs me to do. Not always, but often. And so thinking about how you can put some of these practices in first thing. And so I have some icons here, some things that you could start off with. You need to come up with your own. Maybe stop and jot and think about how could you start your day with some maybe some movement. I always reference Insight Timer because it's a meditation app that's free and has lots of choices. Maybe you create healthy smoothies every day to fuel your body in a good way. Takes the decision making out of breakfast. Maybe you're someone that needs to journal or maybe you just wanna sit and wish and be quiet. Think about what are your big rocks? Because how you start the day is often how that day will go. And so if you begin your day by turning on the news, listening to all the rising um, pandemic disasters and the weather problems, and you are saturating your brain with problems, that's how you're starting your day. Think about, is there a healthier way? Could you read something that would be inspirational? Could you take a, a, a five minute stretch or a walk? Sounds so simple, but it's so effective. And so that's thinking about how to start the day. What I'm gonna encourage you to do is interrupt the day with interoception. And it's really just sensing your body. And I'm gonna give you a few different ways to do this very easily in the midst of your day. Again, we all can't climb to a mountaintop and close our eyes and hum, okay? We have jobs where we have so much to do. But I'm gonna do three short practices that I'm gonna quickly go through and ask you to try on, and maybe one of them will land for you and it could be something that you'd incorporate. The first is a presence pause. I'm gonna ask you to join me now. Just sit up a little bit straighter, take a moment and inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, pause, two, three, four. All that is, is inhaling and exhaling. That's all it is. But if we don't do that, we tend to breathe short and rapid up here in our chest. When we do a present pause, we're actually breathing into our full diaphragm. Another way to do that and just join me is a giant sigh. Everybody join me and just inhale and exhale. There is so much research behind the sigh. So much that shows that it is a very quick reset for the parasympathetic nervous system. And so next time you sigh during a meeting, if someone gives you a look, tell them it's good for you. It's a reset. 
Here's one that I do with students all the time. And what I do is I use this Hoberman sphere. You don't have to have this. I'll show you in a minute what you can do. And so many of us are often trying to find out how to get everybody's attention, whether they're colleagues during a meeting, staff, students. And so I just take this. And when I start to do this, everybody knows to stop, stand, and join me. So I call it the 7-Eleven breath because what you want to do, there's research that shows that if your exhalation is twice as long as your inhalation, it's going to be better for your parasympathetic nervous system. So as I expand this, I want you to breathe into seven. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now inhale to 11. One, I mean, exhale to 11. Sorry. One, two, three, four four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. If you don't have a Hoberman spear, you can just use your hands and expand them as a cue for students. Students quickly get the idea. And if you had difficulty doing the 11, know that with practice, your inhalations and especially your exhalations grow longer. And so those were the quick practices. And now I want to get us into our bodies. And so I'm going to invite you to really follow along to this one. And I'm going to do a quick body scan. When I took the mindfulness-based stress reduction class at Penn, I teach a class in mindfulness and education at Penn. And when I took that, we did a lying down body scan. That's absolutely phenomenal. But we can't always lie down, right? And so what I did is I turned it into a seated scan. And so during this scan, I'm just going to have you rest your awareness, recognize your mind when it wanders, and then bring it back to your anchor. And in this case, your anchor is going to be your breath. And so once again, I'm going to invite you again, let's take our cameras off. I'll take my camera off. And again, I'm going to invite you to stand up. It's good to stand up. It only takes a second. Stand up and this time just stretch way up high and then exhale like you sigh. Exhale. And then as slowly as you can, I want you to sit back down and I want you to use your attention to just find your breath. It was there before. Just notice it. Perhaps you detect it in the nostril area. Maybe you feel cool air coming in and out of the nasal passage. Maybe you detect it best, the chest area, feeling the rise and fall. Maybe you're someone who feels your stomach rise and fall as you breathe. Wherever you detect the breath most, that's what you want to tune into. And now I'm going to do a one minute body scan. This is something you could do at your desk anytime. So taking your hands and placing them flat, flat on your knees, gently closing your eyes. And if you can't do that, you're looking downcast. And I want you to just notice your feet. Just take a second, scrunch up your toes and then release. Our feet carry us through the day. How often do you tune into that area? Now breathe as if your breath could reach your feet. Okay, now we're gonna go all the way to our lower back, major area where so many of us hold on to stress. So breathe into the space in your lower back. See if you detect any tension there. And now go to your shoulders and bring them up to your ears and gently release them back down your back. Noticing you might hear some crinkles and some crackles. And give your jaw a wiggle. Hold a lot of tension in our jaw. And now I just highlighted four of the most prominent tension areas. In this last moment, just expand your awareness to your entire body and just tune into any place where you feel tension. And just like last time, I'll ring the chime. And when you can no longer hear the vibration, 
We'll come back on camera. I wish we had more time. We would debrief a little bit, but I need to keep going. So that's called stop, breathe, and be. And you saw how quickly I did that, something you could do. And so if we're in a face-to-face -face workshop right about now, I would hand out stickers and ask you to place it four places where you would promise yourself you would do one of those practices. Maybe you put it on your computer. Maybe you put it on the refrigerator. Just think of four times that you could practice a pause or a body scan. I always say, if you don't have a minute, you don't have a life. These aren't hard. Nothing's hard, but they take practice. And really, I like to say that well-being is a choice. Um, Richie Davidson's famous for saying that someday mental hygiene will be as common as dental hygiene. And all he means by that is having periods of solitude incorporated into your daily life. But whenever I hear that, I think, yeah, well, we all know to floss too, right? How many of us actually follow through? So well-being is, is, is they say about 47% of well-being is in our choice. And, and as adults, we have choices. It's what makes us have the opportunity to think about how we want to prioritize our time. No one can do it but for you. Believe it or not, you're in charge of the choices you make. And so you can live in the front row and make choices that make you smile like that, or you can be back here in the third row and just get through life. <clears throat> and I'm here to encourage us all to do more than to get through. We want to live a life. We want to live a life of joy. And that's what's going to help give us more balance. And so I did the P and the R and the S in the E. The E is for epigenetics. I certainly don't have enough time to get into it in this presentation, but really epigenetics talks about whether the genes you have inherited are actually going to be expressed. And so all of us have family members that have passed from some disease. So all of us have those genetic predispositions for disease in our body. However, the lifestyle and the choices we make, as I just said a moment ago, are about 47% in our control. So if you haven't heard of epigenetics, take a deeper dive. And the way that you take that deeper dive into doing those things is the simple self-care. I talk in my book about making a Sunday meeting self-care plan where you start on Sundays and instead of just putting in all your appointments, you also schedule some things that you can do for yourself. And they could be like mini retreats. Um, whether they be a walk with a friend or an outing or a bicycle ride, but actually scheduling it and coding it into your weekly routine. And if you're not sure what brings you joy, I always say, look at the photographs in your phone. Please don't do it now. But that gives you a pretty good indicator. Often we take pictures of things we want to remember that bring us joy. So that's a place to think about what you want more of. Because again, we need to accept that there's always going to be more people that need us. There's always going to be more to do than we can do. And there will always be more options about how to spend your time than the time you have. We need to accept that and make some choices. This is a cute video, but I'm going to skip it. I think I'm going to skip because of time. It's really illustrative of how there's always going to be things. I mean, looking at my time, Sandy, it's 3.23. We need a solid 3.30, don't we? Yep. All right. So skipping it. <laughs> it's a good one. Cat videos are sure to certain to help us stress. Um, the next chapter in the book is about focus. And very sadly, it's everyone's favorite. I get the most emails about this. And I hope you've heard this by now. But if you haven't, I'm sorry to crush your bubble. Those of you like me, who, th if your claim to fame is that you're the best multitasker ever alive, you need to know that you're not. There is no such thing as multitasking. We task switch. And every time we do two things simultaneously, both are cognitively not performing as well. That broke my heart. So I'm just going to focus on this one. So being present 
and doing one thing at a time will always be more beneficial. And as educators, you're like, are you kidding me? The last time I did one thing at a time, I don't even remember. I do get it. I, I'm not, I, I am in your world. I'm just saying that deal with what's here before you go on to what's here. And I realize it's a challenge. The other is to revisit the power of no. Um, what can you say no to? In the handouts, I gave something called a decision-making tool, and it gives a list of when someone asks you a question, how you can respond. And there's a list of questions to ask yourself. The last is, if I say yes to this, what am I taking off my plate? Love that. Because remember, we got to take things off our plate before we agree to more. And that's going to allow us to do more single tasking, because the less we have to do, the more opportunity we have. Um, the next chapter is about the negativity bias that correlates with the brain and the stress reaction. And Rick Hansen is really where I got a lot of the research. And what he talks about is that that negativity bias, when I talked about the amygdala that's built into our brain, that's a real thing. And that it takes many positive experiences to compensate for what that one negative experience is. Okay. And so important because the thoughts that are in our head, they can heal or they can harm us. And we want to be aware of those thoughts and stop that negativity bias. Byron Katie is someone that, that talks about don't believe everything you think. Okay, your thoughts aren't always true. So all of these things about neuroplasticity are about taming the frenzy and questioning your thoughts. And this is really just good, healthy emotion regulation because we all know that when we get sick is when a big stressor happens. And so thinking about some of the things that we think are stressful, maybe they're not so bad. Maybe they're not, maybe we make more of situations. Okay, did you see me fast forward through those last slides? Because I'm really careful to stay on time. So I know I shortchanged you just a bit, but I wanted to get here. This is what we want. We wanna envision a better educational system where parents are more present so they're better communicators. There's more joy in teaching. As administrators, we feel more like leaders and less like managers. Those caregivers have less burnout and turnover and our students are more engaged and compassionate. So the last chapter has all things we can do to envision. So one of your last handouts is five thoughts of gratitude. And so as I begin to wrap this up and I'll put a slide up, can you just put in the chat just one or two things that you're grateful for? I always have this gratitude book that I do at the end of every day. I put five things that I'm grateful for. Can you just add some things to the chat, things that you're grateful for? And as you're doing that, I'm gonna advance to my last few slides and Sandy's gonna talk about the giveaway. We did, believe it or not, get through all 10 practices. I'll just put it up there so you can see. We did 10 practices in 45 minutes, a little fast, but I wanted to give you everything I could. And I wanna put up my contact information. Um, if you'd like to know more, if you're interested in ever having a workshop, if you'd like um, me to ever work with your teachers, best way to get me is to send me an email. Um, or go to my, which is lisa at practicingpresence.life, and my website is, is practicingpresence.life. And so now I'm going to quick pause and just look for the gratitude, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sandy that's going to give you an opportunity for a giveaway for that book. Let's see, do we have any gratitudes in that? Yes. And what I notice is often we always, we're, we are so grateful for our health and our families and for people. But if you would every day jot down five new things, you begin to be grateful for the really small things. And that's when you begin to be more present and to appreciate the little things in life. And I just wanna say, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Sandy, thank you for inviting me and thank you all for giving time today to be here. Very much appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. I'm sure everybody just feels a lot more relaxed and in the moment because of your guidance this afternoon. I did put in the chat a link to a Google Doc. If you would like to enter to win one of Lisa's books, we are giving away 10 of her books. Just fill out that form and 10 lucky winners will be uh, contacted. 
by someone from Patton. It could be myself or so, uh, someone else, not sure yet. But 10 people will be randomly chosen out of those Google Docs, and we will send the book to you. So just make sure if you fill it out, you put in the shipping address, wherever you wish for it to be mailed to. And I just want to share, if you send me an email or you sign up online, I put out a bi-weekly, just once every two weeks or three weeks, a blog that has just more tips, really short and practical. You won't get a lot from me, but I like to continue to send tips out. So don't hesitate to reach out. And I have to say, I get that blog. It comes on Sundays and it's always something I look forward to. It's always very positive and uplifting and it is always short and relevant. So, so Again, you can enter for that drawing for the 10 books. And if you are seeking the Act 48 credits or CEUs, the code is PBLW8. PB as in peanut butter, L as in life, W as in wonderful, and the number eight. We appreciate all of your kind attention yesterday and today, and especially this afternoon. We are grateful for you being here, and hopefully you learned some simple tips that you can use with yourself, your family, your friends, your staff, any students that you might be working with, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. And I'm certainly here if anybody had any questions. We just never, were, nobody put any in the chat, did they, Sandy? No. Okay. So that's the conclusion of your workshop, right, Sandy? Yes, we are done. You are the grand finale. And it was a nice way to, to end the summit and the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're getting near the end of the day. Yeah, it's always good to see you. All right, I guess I'll sign off if there's no questions. Thank okay. you so very much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for offering your, your help and guidance. Always a pleasure. Okay, take good care. Thanks always for your constant resources. I'll see you. Thanks. Bye.